Well, hello. Welcome. Come in, gather round. <laughs> Thank you for coming to this evening's presentation of Cosmo White doing his artist talk for his show, Beneath Its Tongue, The Fish Rolls the Hook to Sharpen Its Cadence. My name is Ariel Jones, and I am the development officer here at MOCA GA. Tonight is brought to you by our Working Artist Project Program. It is a program that gives substantial support to a working artist, a mid-career working artist in the city, so that Atlanta can become a place where artists can live, work, and thrive. The program is generously supported by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Antonori Foundation, the Charles Lordans Foundation, and the AEC Trust. Cosmo White employs drawing and sculpture. <laughs> Give me all your laughs. To explore the intersections of race, nationalism, and displacement. Beneath its tongue, the fish rolls the hook to sharpen its cadence, introduces a new body of works that investigate how shared histories shape the process of diasporic self-expression. How can various 21st century migrants recount, reconcile their colonial past and its various echoes while actively shedding the burdens of nationalism and origin. What new accents, inflections, and cadences might emerge from this process? What is at risk of being misheard in translation? And so now, without further ado, I present Cosmo White. All right, thank you all for coming and braving this Atlanta traffic. Um, yeah. um, so to start off this talk, I'm going to start with the, the title and just um, walk you through some of my thought process um, in coming up with, with the title and, and then not so much talking about what every single piece means, but um, trying to provide you with the framework for some of the questions I was thinking about as I was creating this body of work and, um, and then give you a little uh, peek behind the curtain, no pun intended, um, about the process of making some of these works because a lot of the works here um, is done in a collaborative uh, nature. All right, so the title, I know it's pretty long-winded, but um, I wanted a title that played with the, the concept of the hunter and the hunted. So this idea of the fish um, using the hook that is used to capture it and um, using it as a device to actually um, sharpen it the way it articulates something and actually uh, turns the onus not so much on the fisherman but now on the fish and actually asking what is it that the, the historically hunted or the historically um, disenfranchised has to say. So um, the, the exhibition, um, when I got the, when I was a finalist for the MOCA GA um, award, there was uh, an interview process and I had pitched the idea of this uh, beaded curtain. And in my mind it was going to be this massive beaded curtain that was going to span across uh, the entire uh, ex uh, uh, gallery and it was it came about as I was thinking about different ways of engaging with the archives I've been using archival imagery in my drawings before and I started distorting them as you see here um, with this image which I'll get to in a minute where you see um, the image has been distorted in, in um, so I was fascinated I've always been fascinated by how do you how does one engage with the archive how does one um, recontextualize the archive and um, like all beginnings with, with new bodies of work for me, I try to go back to um, a memory of Jamaica, memory of my time in Jamaica and one of the things that I always, 
interestingly enough, a lot, a lot of times with my work, I find myself going back to domestic spaces within Jamaica. And I started thinking about these beaded curtains that would um, delineate different spaces within the, the, the domestic. Um, so the beaded curtains oftentimes would be, um, be by the entrance of the kitchen. And it serves practical purposes where it prevents flies from going in and out. But I like the idea of this, this uh, border or this, this, um, this barrier that in order for you to engage with the rest of the show, you need to breach. And so I began the process of trying to figure out um, how to, to bring this, this idea to life. So during the interview process as a finalist, I pitched the idea as one of the pieces that would be in the show. And then um, once I, I, I got the award, it became a long process. I felt like the entire year was spent, okay, how does this happen? So um, I went through various different iterations. I contacted many different fabricators. I even um, at one point was thinking maybe this should be a glass beaded curtain that the, the viewer goes through. And so I went through all of these different iterations. And I remember at the very early stages, I had a conversation with um, two really close friends of mine, Josh and Natasha. Um, they were uh, close friends from, from grad school. And I mentioned the idea to them. I was like, you know, I'm thinking of this, this archival curtain that you need to walk through in order to engage the show. And, um, and then later on, a couple months later, we revisited the conversation and they were actually the ones that approached me and they said, hey, after I had been going through dead end to dead end in terms of finding the fabricators or finding just the materials that I'd want for it, they said, you know, how about we work together in terms of um, bringing this idea of yours to fruition? So they're part of a collective called Heckler. And Heckler is a, um, a collective that examines hospitality and conflict, critically examines hospitality and conflict. So we began the process of, uh, of um, I, I singled out the image that I was interested in, in working with, and then we began the process of, of uh, designing and fabricating this. Um, so the image itself, um, and I knew I wanted something that, the, that was fraught with tension that the viewer had to enter into first. Um, so the, the image itself is of the Brixton riots from 1981. And um, I had certain um, rules for myself. Uh, I knew this was a, a riot that is fraught with many different interpretations. So if you, if you go by the um, standard uh, Scotland Yard's uh, depiction of or interpretation of the event is very different from what the West Indian community felt uh, was was the culminating factors or the cause of this 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 riot. Um, so it's this event that is uh, prone to many different interpretations, but what is undeniable is that it was this uh, this this riot that that um, burnt down uh, a large section of Brixton and. Um, one of the rules I had for myself was that if I was depicting any trauma whatsoever, I had to be very, very responsible and, um, of how I was depicting particularly the black bodies in this. So, um, so it, went, it was a process of going through all of these images and finding the ones that I felt was, um, that fit this criteria that I, I felt handled um, the subject matter with some kind of responsibility. But then beyond that, it was an image that I felt lent itself to a certain level of ambiguity that this could be a contemporary riot or somewhat contemporary or could reference a contemporary riot. Because I understand that within this show, there are many different references to many different geographical locations but it's happening here in Atlanta. So um, the show is an engagement with this location and I have to give the viewers enough that they can um, see themselves reflected somewhat within the work. Um, while also honoring 
the specificity of those locations. So this is still Brixton, but there's ambiguity. There's enough ambiguity to this curtain, to this image, that it could be, it could reference Ferguson. It could reference the Watts riots in LA. Um, it's it's the idea is that it would be broad enough. But um, what I wanted to is by the viewer entering the curtain, they disrupt the legibility of the curtain. They breach this this event, this arc, um, and it. Um, symbolically engaged with the archive. And then you're into into the space and then um, at the heart of my practice is always drawing. I've always drawn as a child and I consider it to be the, the one thing that I always go back to. Um, so then you would engage with the various drawings. And um, so the drawing over the corner here is called um, stretch marks and keloids. And this is based on um, archival images of West Indian women, Jamaican women particularly, who are part of the auxiliary constabulary force um, uh, in the 1940s, so it's during World War II. So I, I remember as I was going through the various archives, it just blew my mind to see um, an image of women serving in the army during World War II, and I, it's something I don't, you don't see very often and particularly Jamaican women, and they are part, they're engaged in a ceremony called Empire Day, and it was um, established by Elizabeth I to instill a sense of pride in being part of the British Empire to the various colonies. And so I wanted to um, recontextualize the image so by distorting it, by mirroring it, um, it goes from a salute to the British Empire to a fist bump between um, two members of said empire. Um, and the, the emphasis or the emphasis is taken away from the empire itself and it becomes uh, a moment between these two women as opposed to a salute to the queen and empire. Um, so again, you have these two engagements with the archives immediately. Um, and the, disruption, the distortion being mirrored, whereas you physically, the viewer, have to distort that archival image. This archival image is, is distorted and um, on the onset. The title itself, Keloids and Stretch Marks. The stretch marks is kind of easier to understand because I'm literally stretching the image. The keloids is the scraping that, um, that the white that you see in all of my drawings, or not all of the drawings, but in a number of the drawings, are actually scrape marks. Um, so I, I abrase the, the surface of the paper. And for me, um, I remember first learning about keloids. I'm, <laughs> my mom is in the audience. But uh, my mom would always tell me, you know, be careful. Your skin is prone to keloids because I was one of those kids who was constantly riding their bikes, climbing trees, falling everywhere, constantly bruised. Um, but as I kind of delved more into this, this idea of keloids and everything, I, I found it quite fascinating. So it's a buildup of scar tissue on the surface of your skin. It disproportionately affects people with uh, melanin. But I started to think of um, is it possible for us to rethink the way we, we view scars on the body? And for me, I, I thought this idea of the keloid would be this great um, metaphor for history. So the scarification or the scarring of the skin is the body's way of recording a historical event. So it's, it becomes a, a, a visual language that I employ in the various drawings. So yeah, so you walk in and and there's that. Um, now, the, the We Buy Gold is something that is, um, that piece is called No Longer Yours. And for that one, actually these two drawings here, I'm specifically engaging with um, America and the West Indian diaspora in America. So they're from a body of, um, th th these are from a body of drawings called, I, I refer to as playing mass which is the term used to participate in um, carnival or juve. And they're actually taken from photographs that I took while attending 
various juvies, so whether it's Miami or New York, and then the drawings become these compilations. But uh, Carnival in the Caribbean um, is, is quite fascinating. It was a space in which the different classes could intermingle, but it was also a means of critiquing the, the power structure. Um, so there was a lot of mimicry and um, a lot of satire. And um, I particularly found this one practice that is, is, is used a lot in Grenada, Guyana, and um, well, Grenada mainly, and uh, Trinidad, um, called Jab Jabs, in which they cover themselves in oil, or in some cases, burnt sugar. And the juve starts just before sun, sunrise. And, um, and it, the, these masqueraders go through a process of um, invisibility because they're covered and crusted in, in burnt sugar or covered in oil, so you can't see them. And as the sun rises, they become visible and the masquerade reveals itself to you. And I thought that was quite poetic. And um, so I started doing these series of drawings based on on these, these uh, masqueraders. And this is part of, of that. Um, and I, I wanted there to be a juxtaposition between the heavily colonial, um, at, which is also, with, it, with its new recontextualization, serves as a critique of colonialism and carnival, which is inherently, in its origin, a critique of the colonial structure. Um, but this is, Carnival in the U.S. So this is contemporary. So this is within, to be blunt, the Trump administration. So what I found fascinating is what does it mean for, in this time when there's all of this anti-immigrant sentiments, for immigrants to gather in mass and declare themselves present and hold space. So I found that very, very interesting. Um, so for me, that's what the importance of these drawings, why I keep going to these crowds. And, um, but the, the term, we buy gold itself, is also referencing these pawn shops that I would see around Atlanta. And I always view them as this kind of pre predatory practice of, of uh, 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 buying your heirlooms and then reselling them at a much higher price. Um, but it's also, I felt, a good way of talking about the history of um, foreign intervention into a place like the Caribbean, where from the arrival of Columbus to current um, Chinese and Spanish um, interest in the Caribbean, there's always been an interest in uh, the acquisition of, of gold. And gold is, is used very loosely, because gold meant very different things at, and, uh, at very different times. So at one point, sugar was gold. At one point, banana was co considered green gold. Um, in some cases, there's actually uh, physical gold present. In other cases, there's oil. But there's always uh, a need for the, for the accumulation of natural resources. And I feel these developing nations become just these cogs in a larger wheel in this accumulation of, of, um, of resources. So the We Buy Gold is also referenced again at the very back. So there's a neon, so some of this glow that you're seeing here is a neon sign that says We Buy Gold, but it's in Mandarin. And that came about when I remember once I was traveling with my mom and we were going to, um, to Kingston from Montego Bay. So that's a three hour drive from the west side of the island to the, to the east. And we hit a section of the island in which uh, there was a new development. And they're building the, the highway that would connect the, the east to the west. And all of it was in Mandarin. And it struck me that it was Chinese, uh, the Chinese presence. But I, to be very clear, I'm not, um, it's important for me to, to recognize solidarity in, in the, the Chinese workers who are there because they, they, like the rest of us, are a cog in a larger wheel. Um, so uh, the We Buy Gold too is, um, is not something that could be, that, 
a non-Chinese speaker would readily see. So it's it, j just like the signage that we saw driving through um, that side of the island, it was not meant for us. Um, it was being articulated for someone else. So just as you have here in the English, the we buy gold, and we understand the predatory nature of, of that practice, the, the we buy gold is, is, is created in, in an attempt to create some kind of solidarity between these workers that um, I feel are also a cog in a larger wheel, um, this kind of neocolonial wheel. Um, and then uh, we have this large speaker here, which is a sculpture I made with um, my, my uncle, actually. Um, and that's his voice you hear. So the, the sculpture, the idea with the sculpture is that it, it is incomplete until there are four um, sound pieces that go with it. This is the second one. Um, so once there's four sound pieces, then um, I will no longer engage with this particular piece. Um, and the first iteration of this was um, the sounds of crashing waves from uh, different diasporic, diasporic sites. So I went to um, South Carolina and Montego Bay and then uh, Ghana, um, Cape Town, no, Cape Coast, Cape Coast in Ghana, and then um, Liverpool in London. So all of these diasporic sites that were instrumental in the transatlantic trade, slave trade, um, come coming out of, of, of the speaker, but also all the field notes. Every conversation I had and I got permission to record the person or anything along those journeys was recorded in, in that sound piece. In this one, it's an interview while I was building the sound piece with my uncle of him talking about the history of sound culture in Jamaica. So the history of, um, in, this, in this case, he's talking here about the, the phenomena of the reverb that you hear a lot in dub and reggae and how it came about by um, a lack of resources and the ingenuity of people to make do with what is available and in, in so doing in creating these speaker uh, sculptures uh, the sound reverb was born because of the materials that were used to build the speakers but after that it became institutionalized as part of the music and, and mimicked with technology after a while but he also talks about the importance of the sound system within the ecology of a neighborhood. So he's talking about a particular neighborhood close to where my parents, where my mother and that side of the family grew up. And there was this one particular sound system called Soul Imperial and how it, it brought so much revenue into the neighborhood because the, the guy who owned the speakers, whenever he threw on a party, vendors would come, whatever they're selling, goes to paying for their children to go to school. He could build on to his, his, his house, it becomes a recording studio for emerging musicians. So it creates this whole ecology. Um, and so that becomes the second sound um, component of this piece. And I collaborated with my cousin, who is a, a, a musical engineer. So it's punctuated by a, a, a sound piece that he, he created. Um, and the idea is that there will be two more iterations of this before this piece is put to rest. Um, and then finally we have um, this piece here which is the, the salt fish. Um, and I, I knew I wanted an exhibition in which uh, all of your senses were activated. So sound, touch, immediately as you're walking through the exhibition you're, you're feeling the weight of the beads, and I wanted it to be these nickel plated. Uh, well, it, it so happened that we came, I came back to this initial suggestion of a nickel plated uh, beaded curtain, and um, it was perfect because there's a weight to them, and you feel the weight of that image as you walk through it. And then on the far end of the exhibition is this, this salt encrusted fish. Um, and uh, for the Jamaicans or the, the people from the Caribbean in the room, there's, there's a, a, self, a sense of 
uh, association with the smell of salt fish. It, it harkens you back to dishes in the Caribbean. The Jamaica's national dish is um, salt fish and ac ackee and salt fish. But that salt fish was brought from Norway during um, both slavery and well into indentured labor ship as a cheap source of protein for, for um, the slaves and then the indentured laborers. So there's an interconnected, um, what I'm trying to do is create these, cross these boundaries with the use of materials. So you have the Brixton riots over there, so that situates you in London, but over here we're both in the Caribbean and Norway simultaneously. And then it's all of these mapping pins which I think are symbolic of marking location are placed onto it. And then these, this custom made uh, jewelry that mimics the scale of the fish as well. Um, yeah, so um, at this point, I guess we could open it up to, to questions. Yes. So, um, I, over the summer, I was fortunate enough to be in London, and I, uh, I visited um, the, there's the Caribbean Archive in Brixton, I visited the Stuart Hall Archive, and I visited the Tate's Archive, and I visited the London Archive, the London Library Archive. But then, digitally, I went through Getty, um, which is where this image ultimately came from, and I um, paid for the rights to use it. Um, and um, also, the, there's the, I'm going to mess up the name, but I think it's the Caribbean, um, the Caribbean Archive, the Caribbean Photo Archive, which is another uh, digital platform that has, which shares images with the Getty as well. Um, yeah, so for me, it's always, I have this ongoing collection of images, and First, it's just what strikes me. And then from there, I'll put it aside. And then later on, I'll go through and then start doing the specific in, um, investigations into them to see. Um, and then it leads you in this rabbit hole, and you start going in other places, yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, so. Um, at the point at which I, I just said, decided, okay, I'm going to make the speaker sculpture, I'll be honest, I thought I was being super original, and then I did all my research, and I was just like, oh my God, there's so many speaker sculptures. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's a fantastic one at the high by Nadine Robinson. Is it Nadine? But it's, it's beautiful. But yeah, so there are all of these speaker sculptures, and I, I was still committed to the idea, but for me, I wanted it to be different enough that it could stand on its own, but it be in conversation with all the speaker sculptures that are out there. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, a wave, and what I wanted to was a speaker sculpture that um, kind of worked at odds with what a speaker sculpture typically does. So it's the, this big imposing um, sculpture that is meant to hit you from all the way across the room, but with it being a wave, in order to get the, the highest pitch, you have to literally stand under it, or under, under it, or right in front of it, sorry. And then it becomes a very, um, a more private interaction. So you can hear from a distance, but then, um, and it's, uh, it's wired in such a way that only the, 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 all the tweeters at the top are at the lowest volume. So you only really hear everything once right under it. Um, and also growing up, I, always, I was always fascinated by speaker sculptures, or sound systems. They're, I call them sculptures, but they're just, everyone else calls them sound systems. Um, but they would be everywhere in, in, in Jamaica. And what I always, um, I remember you know, when I first came to the US, I was struck by how quiet it, it was, because there's always music. And I have this running joke that you, know, you can't be in Jamaica for more than two days without hearing Celine Dion somewhere <laughs> in the distance. Um, but yeah, these speaker sculptures, and I always thought of them as um, or totem poles, you know, or, 
or minimalist sculptures, you know, they, um, the way they're stacked, I always found them quite beautiful. Any other questions? Yes. A little bit of both. So I'll go back and forth. So I'll draw and sometimes t take a photograph of it, and, you know, play around with it, you know, Photoshop and then go back. Or sometimes I just go straight. It just, it varies. Yeah. But then there's always a moment where I, I sit with a, a drawing for a minute to, to just see where next it, it needs to go. Um, Yes. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, and that's something that is, has been evolving for me the longer I live in the US. Um, the longer I live here, the more I'm invested in here and the more um, distance I feel from Jamaica, right? And, um, and as I create work, I'm always trying to be true to where I am now and my experience here. So, this is not work that is, um, this, all of this work reads differently in Jamaica or even in London, Norway, where, where have you. Um, and in, in terms of this question of legibility, I embrace, instead of fighting um, this kind of slippage in le legibility, I remember in grad school a lot of questions would be, who is this for, who's your audience? Um, and I remember initially being frustrated with that question and thinking the audience is whoever is standing in front of it. Um, with the understanding that there are specific nuances that a particular community will pick up on immediately. Um, for me, I have come to embrace this, this slippage in legibility because it also feels true to my own experience of living in the U.S. And uh, I remember first coming to, to, to the U.S. and trying to navigate the nuances and the many moving parts of race and just thinking it's so different from the Jamaican context. Where does one even begin um, to understand this internal system here? Um, so I never approach anything with this idea of it, um, it being a universal language. So what I do is a steep more into the specificity of my own discomfort or resistance of, how do I explain that? Um, I guess my own discomfort in understanding that now I am I'm as much American as I am Jamaican, but not quite, and all of this, and I'm still figuring this out and working through all of that. So embracing all of that and understanding that any show that I put on is going to represent all of these different clashing of locations and nuances that are going to be lost on some, but some pick up on others, and vice versa, and just embrace them. Does that answer the question? Okay. 
Anybody else? No? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, some of it is to create kind of this visual um, homogeny or visual. I'm always in for interested in work that references one another, and um, so in terms of ornamentation, um, again, I'm going to go back to the domestic space in the Caribbean. But I've always loved going into a Caribbean home and seeing the doilies on the 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 TV or the, the sofa, the settee, or the plastic over the, the, the couch. And um, for me, there's a reverence for the space. And it's uh, the, the uh, things that are deemed worthy are, mark, are, are marked by these ornaments. So uh, my using it in, in, the, in the work as a way of drawing that cultural reference, but also um, understanding that they, they, are, they have, a lot of them have these colonial ties, and there's a, a level of, um, what is the word, uh, contradiction that exists within the Caribbean that um, I always find fascinating where it's, it's um, a region that prides itself on its independence and um, but has gone through a colonial process that they're tied to these colonial uh, powers in a way that um, they cannot tease themselves from. So the doilies are both Spanish, but you see them in England too, and I, but they become something else. They go through a process and they become something else within the Caribbean context. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Or or a waste. Yeah. Mm hmm Okay. <laughs> it might be. I mean, and I don't mind that that um, interpretation. So if it references like a Persian. Kind of, um, I mean, there's a Persian uh, presence in, in Jamaica, there's a Persian presence throughout the Caribbean. So, I mean, it's really a region that mirrors the US in a lot of fascinating ways in terms of this idea of the Creole, this, you know, melt. Uh, I hate the term melting pot because, yeah, it's a salad, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So, it mirrors the, the US. Um, in that, yeah. So I don't mind if someone sees the Persian. And a lot. Uh, what I really want to is to view this work more as a conversation rather than me having um, an agenda that I'm trying to push. I'm probing a set of questions that I don't know the answers to. And if you're willing to join me on this windy journey, I might end up at a cul-de-sac and I have to turn back around. But I mean. Yeah, and that's how I feel delving down the archives as well. Like, I don't, I'll know it when I see it, but I don't really know it. You know, I'm just going down this rabbit hole and enjoying going through this rabbit hole. Yes. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the selection process, there's always going to be something that draws me to that particular image that is personal. So for instance, but they're all backstory that I don't necessarily feel the viewer needs to know the specific backstories for, but that informs my selection process. So for instance, like this one here, I remember my sister went to the girls' school across from me and across from the boys school that I, all boys school that I went to and when I was going to uh, go get a taxi to go home I would pass by the girls schools and the, the, the cadets at her school would be doing that salute and this is in the 90s right well into independence but it's one of these echoes of, of colonialism so when I saw the image there was something about it that I was just like, this reminds me of something. So, but I don't expect the viewer to know all of that. Uh, with the photographs, they were very, very personal because I'm using my own body as, um, a, as a subject. And that was intentional because there's all these politics around you know, the photo photographing others. And the archival images also represent me trying to work through you know, what does it mean to be making figurative work right now, particularly uh, archival images of others, um, and especially if it's like a recalcitrant um, kind of act where they're pushing against a power structure, how do I do that in such a way that is not fetishizing um, trauma or, or anything like that, but um, so I, I'm still trying to play with all of those things. Um, and those are the guiding questions behind, for instance, this body of work. As far as it being personal, um, I mean, I'll start. Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so when engaging with these archival images, I, I'm also thinking about um, what is it, um, what more can this image say that, um, isn't readily apparent on first glance. So for instance, like the, these images of, of these women participating in, in, um, in Empire Day, how can I do something that is akin to um, this Brixton ride or these, these carnival scenes? Because they're going to be in conversation when I bring them into the room. So by distorting it and trying to recontextualize it. I'm on one hand trying to uh, critique this practice of Empire Day, but also um, you know, have be in conversation with these other pieces here. Does that answer? Kind of, not really. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we can talk. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, or just leaving, leaving things unfinished, you mean? Oh, right, yeah, yeah, so, um, 
Uh, just slowly introducing color into the drawings. Yeah, so I've started to introduce color into some of the drawings. I, 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 um, in undergrad, I was a, a painter, so, and um, I felt that I would do these drawings as preparation for the paintings, and the drawings would always be better than the paintings. I would lose something in the process of painting. And then um, I saw the work of William Kendridge, and it was kind of like, oh, drawings can stand on their own. They can just be drawings. But now um, I'm starting to reintroduce color, albeit slowly. <laughs> um, yeah, so just reintroduce color. And you know, with each drawing, I'm trying to try something new. So that's, that's what you're seeing in, with that one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the thing that was in the back of my mind through this whole process was I wanted it to feel cohesive because I knew I was also doing a show that I was only going to include around eight pieces. So um, I also wanted it to feel as though space was being occupied. So the glow of the red, it occupies space. Um, uh, and also, I was very um, deliberate in the, in the choice of colors. So that blue of the wall bounces off the blue in, in that piece, the nocturnal in blue and gold. And then, of course, the gold is referenced in, in all of them. Um, even in the neon sign, which is glowing red, is saying, we buy gold. So the gold is being referenced everywhere. So um, it was just about being very, very intentional and, and um, going through, in my head, many different iterations. Uh, I mean, I've been in Atlanta for many, many years now. And I've gone to so many of these. Um, Mocha GA shows, and every time I walk into the space, I would always think, if I got the chance, what would I do? <laughs> you know, I was telling Matt Hafner, uh, when I first moved, his show was the first one I saw, and from then, he had the big um, cutout of the giant, sleeping giant. From then, you know, my imagination was captured, and I was just thinking, how would I orient this space and, and try to make it my own? So. Um, you, what you see here is just me deliberately playing with things and, yeah. And knowing that there's only, I mean, not that there's only, there are eight pieces in the show, so they have to, they, I, like, I like it because there's enough room for each to breathe, but the biggest piece is literally at the doorway, and I remember we put it up, so I worked with Josh Nurjinski, who is another, um, third of the, the Heckler group. Um, and we put it up with uh, Cloyd um, Smith, uh, my Mocha GA uh, apprentice. Um, and so we put it up, and then afterwards, you're left with an entirely empty room, uh, and you're just like, oh my god, <laughs> all of this work, and the room is still empty, right? Um, so just, yeah, so everything was just intentional. And, Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is that it? <laughs> 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 <laughs>